So good evening. Um, thank you for joining us today in this round table with the architect Frank Gehry and ethnomusicologist Robert Garfias, which is an honor to present. My name is Sylvia Perea. I am the curator of the architecture and design collection at the Art, Design and Architecture Museum here on campus. And for the organization of this event, I had the great pleasure of collaborating with Professor Fabio Rambelli, who is the Chair of Religious Studies here at UCSB. Professor Rambelli and I would like to thank our panelists for kindly accepting our invitation to speak about architecture and gagaku. Gagaku is the court music of Imperial Japan, Shinto and Buddhist temples, which is considered the oldest orchestral music in the world. We have to confess that we received Mr. Gary's and Mr. Garfia's acceptance to participate in this roundtable with as much joy as panic. Neither of us is an expert in each other's fields, so please bear with us. We would also like to extend our gratitude to Mrs. Dilling, the wife of our chancellors. Um, thank you for, for being here with us today. And our gratitude goes as well to the departments of development and protocol, as well as to all of the students who have helped us to put this event together. Now, sound and space have been linked intellectually since ancient times. With his famous music of the spheres theory, the Greek philosopher Pythagoras already posited that a planet's journey in space produced a vibration that had to be audible even if it was not perceptible to the human ear. Throughout history, such interdependence between sound and space has engendered uplifting site-specific musical compositions. Bach, Mozart, Wagner, Yanis Shenakis, Max Neuhaus, are just a few composers who have written genuine musical pieces for the rooms where they were meant to be performed. Mejor? Good? Okay. Sorry, I hope you didn't <laughs> lose too much. Um, we were talking about composers who have written specific pieces for specific rooms throughout history. While music is usually considered the art of design in time, in architecture, the art of design in space, they enhance each other. A musical composition can enliven a room as much as a concert hall can ele elevate the music experience. If architecture, as Goethe said, is frozen music, then we can think of buildings as instruments that architects can tune and musicians play. Similarly to architectural design, musical composition relies on color, texture, rhythm, harmony and proportion. Not surprisingly, the emotions produced by the finest music are comparable to those produced by an innovative and precise architecture. Today, we will explore these and other avenues with two maestros that need little introduction. Professor of Anthropology, Musicologist, and Ethnomusicologist, Robert Garfias, whose life has been devoted to the study, dissemination, and preservation of ethnic music from around the world. To Professor Garfias, we owe the introduction of the study and practice of gagaku in the US, as well as the publication of the only book on this subject, also in the country. Professor Garfias' long-standing scholarly work on Japanese music and culture has been awarded the Order of the Rising Sun, the highest honor bestowed by the Japanese government to a non-Japanese citizen that he received from the Emperor of Japan. Joining him today and us is Maestro Architect Frank Gehry, a Japanophile and music lover in his own words, and author of some of the most celebrated concert halls around the world. The Meriwether Post Pavilion in Columbia, the New World Center in Miami, the Walt Disney Hall in Los Angeles, or the Pierre Boulet Salle in Berlin, to cite just a few. Mr. Gary's outstanding and sustained contributions to the advancement of contemporary architecture have been recognized with the prestigious Pritzker Prize, among many other awards as well as with the widespread recognition of being the best living architect in the world. Following an introduction to Gagaku by Professor Rambelli, um, Professor Garfias will make an introduction as well. 
and then we will follow up with a round table with Mr. Gary and Mr. Garfias. Please use the cards that you find in your seats to enter your name and questions for our panelists today. Thank you again for your presence, and please join me in welcoming Professor Rambelli to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as a very brief introduction, I would like to say a few words about Gagaku uh, and how it is related to UCSB and why we're all here tonight. And Professor Garfias will have much more to say in a moment about, about, about this type of music. So as Sylvia said, uh, Gagaku is the ceremonial music of the Imperial Court of Japan and the most important Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines of that country. It has a very long history as it was brought to Japan in the seventh century. Um, it has always been performed since then in an uninterrupted line. The repertory, which was fixed around the 11th century, the instruments based on prototypes from the 6th and 7th centuries, and the musicians, the members of a dozen or so uh, hereditary families, also dating back to the 7th century. Now, Gagaku is an amazing kind of music. Well, we can talk about that. Some people like it, some people don't. But um, it's, uh, you know, it has exotic instruments and melodies, archaic sounds, uh, ritualism. Uh, Gagaku is also the first example, I think, of uh, what we could call world music. It is from Japan, but it includes music, dances, and instruments from ancient China, Korea, Central Asia, India, and Southeast Asia. And in the last 60 centuries or so, sorry, 60 years or so, it has inspired musicians and composers all over the world. New compositions for Gagaku instruments in the style of contemporary music are being created every year. In fact, we have a concert scheduled here at UCSB on November 7th. There was a slide about that a moment ago, where we will be presenting some new compositions for Gagaku instruments by mostly American composers. Now, here at UCSB, I have created, with the help of many colleagues in various departments, a Gagaku project. And we organize performances and workshops by master musicians from Japan. You have seen some, uh, you know, the video that you saw uh, is based on one of those. Um, international conferences and also a small Gagaku ensemble. And several of my graduate students are part of it, and they are here with us tonight. I see them. Um, now, you may wonder why me, a professor of religious studies, is interested in Gagaku at all. Gagaku is a unique way uh, to experience firsthand important aspects of Japanese culture, not only the ritual aspects, but also traditional learning techniques, rules of courtesy, general attitudes, and so forth. Gagaku also has a very interesting metaphysics of music, deeply related to religions and philosophies of China and India, uh, Confucianism and Buddhism in particular. Gagaku also has an interesting history here in California, where it was brought by Japanese immigrants around the 1930s. And there is a tradition of performance here. And composer Henry Eichham, who moved to Santa Barbara in the, in the 1920s, was fascinated by this music, which also influenced some of his compositions. The musical instruments that Eichheim collected are now preserved at UCSB. And Eichheim, in turn, transmitted this passion to other composers, such as uh, you know, Henry Cowell, and from Henry Cowell to John Cage and others. It is my hope that, with the support of all of you, uh, we will be able to continue to develop this important project uh, on Gagaku that will enrich and inspire our community on campus and beyond. So thank you. Thank you all uh, for, for participating here tonight. And please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Garfias to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so pleased to see so many people. Can't be interested in Gagaku. It must be everybody's come to see Frank. <laughs> he, he's very interesting. He's a very interesting fellow and tells great story. Am I, this one am I? Okay. Um, Gagaku is something I know a little bit about, but I, I, I've pursued a lot of music, spent many, many years traveling all over and collecting recipes at the same time. and learning different languages, so. Uh, but Japanese was a real challenge. Uh, so, but it, I put this up, this is a greeting card. It's an invitation from the Imperial Palace. If you get one of these, you get to go into the palace. It's got the emperor's seal up there at the top. 
the uh, um, yeah the chrysanthemum is the the seal of the emperor and it's embossed. Then it's just a picture of one of the dancers and it folds and the inside would be written to your invitation. That was a nice way to begin. It gives you an idea of the introduction. But for a long, long time and for much of the time that I was in Japan, Gagaku was considered very esoteric and most Japanese had never heard it or said it wasn't worth listening to or they thought of it, it was foreign music. Now it's gotten a lot better. They, a lot of younger ensembles are playing it, and there are a number of groups who play outside the palace. Um, I want to say I could talk a lot about this, and I'm used to talking a lot. As a matter of fact, being a professor for so many years, I think in 50-minute segments. But I'll try to um, control myself. And, but my challenge is that for most of you, a garaku is a very strange, exotic, or maybe something totally unknown to you. But there are a few people in here, I think, who are performers in the gagaku group. So I want to say something interesting to you, too, and to the rest of you, to give you an insight. I can't, this, it's very complex, but let's just talk about time and space. It sounds very cosmic, I know, but um, I, I'm going to try to keep it on the ground. We'll get a little cosmic, perhaps, but I, I want to begin, and it looks like I'm going way afield, and I shouldn't probably do this because I only have a few minutes to talk to you, but some of you may recognize this as the Palace of Mirrors in Versailles. This is a picture I took in 1965. I've been there many times since, but every, even with better cameras, I can't seem to capture the immensity of the place. And I thought, what is it? It's only about 240 feet long, but it's 40 feet high, the space inside. But when you walk in there, I felt the audacity of somebody putting a roof over this much space and saying it's mine. Uh, so if you go right out from here, you're out on the terrace, and Louis XIV planned this beautifully manicured. He didn't do it himself, but of course, he authorized it. But it goes on and on and it goes on into the French countryside. I own all of this. So the sense of space and power that it was embodied by the emperor, the king, he, he uh, controlled everything and so everything could be as big as, it want, as big as he wanted it to be because he was everything. He was the center of everything. Let's take another example. This is much more. The, the Quartier Latin, the Vieux Carré is only about a mile square, but when you're walking in there, you have this, this distinct sense of the difference in architecture. You're in a different world. You're totally immersed in this world. So the space, the architecture creates this space, and you're in this completely different area. Now, let's talk about Japan at last. Uh, in the middle of the city of Kyoto, prime real estate, there's a, a park it's called the Gosho. That means a sacred place. And it's a 1,300 meters long, 720 meters wide. A chunk, like, a little bit like uh, Central Park in the middle of New York, except you can't drive through it, can't drive around it. No vehicles of any kind are permitted. V uh, bicycles. The noodle vendors drive through the middle and they get to the other side of town. But otherwise, you've got to go all the way around. Prime real estate. And smack in the middle of it, still, this is the old imperial palace before they moved to, to Tokyo, to Edo. This, there's a wall, and that, that inner wall is uh, 450 meters long, uh, 250 meters wide. And inside is the old imperial palace. So this is like large space within, and then a smaller protected space inside. Nobody goes inside here. You have to have a special invitation. The only person who can sleep here is the emperor. And when he comes to visit Kyoto, he can stay here and with his entourage. Otherwise, nobody stays here. It's empty. It is a museum, and people can come in and visit it. But as you begin to see this, you get a sense it's like a public park. People will come and have picnics and sit, but not inside, in the outer walls. And this, then this wall with the five stripes indicating the emperor, imperial family, that, that houses the palace inside. So you go inside, and the, if you go to the main entrance, the main audience hall, far in the back was where the emperor would sit, then the tachibana tree and the plum tree on each side of the emperor 
representing the left and right of the emperor. And then the, there's a plaza out there, and then beyond, they're out here. So all of the plebeians, when they were allowed to even get this far, could only come this far. And they could sit and way in the recesses where the emperor, if you had to have say something to the emperor, you would have to kneel on the ground there and bow and speak. But all the space belonged to the emperor. So in this, um, this great area, sacred area, he also had music. And one of the interesting common factors between the ancient court music of Japan and Korea and also the Turkish Ottoman court, which is still very strong. Now, there were court musics, of course, in China. That's where all this came from, but they don't exist anymore. They're now reconstructing it, trying to, but uh, they, they, there are various experiments being done. But the tradition is gone. In Japan, it's a father-to-son tradition that goes back to the 7th century. You, we have documented whose father was who and the son and so forth. So they played in these places, in and around the palace, and, in, for, and for the emperor. One of the characteristics of all these imperial royal musics, either for the Ottoman Sultan, is that once the emperor is in power, the idea is that it would last forever. He would be there forever and ever. So the music goes on and on. It isn't lively jumping tunes. The music goes on. There's even a piece in the, in the Korean court music repertoire called Sujichon, beautiful piece. Sujichon means as long life as everlasting as the sky. We're in power and we're going to be here forever. So the music goes on and on and on. If you hear Dagaku today, uh, if you hear this long, long, slowly moving on, and then you fall asleep and you come back, oh, there's still, there's, oh, it's a different note now. Oh. <laughs> Well, there was something else going on in the Heian period. Sometimes they would, this is when the music flourished mostly in Japan, then it continued on until the present, gradually forgetting a lot of things because with time they forgot things and the tradition got strong and weak and, and now it's getting strong again, but a lot has been lost in the process. This is the outdoor performance. Here are shrine maidens in Kasuga doing the same genre of music, but it's, it's uh, sacred Shinto music in this case. Um, Little children sometimes dance bugaku. This is a bugaku dance of Karyobin. It's the bird of uh, the m bird that appeared when Buddha attained enlightenment. So two little boys dance this, or little girls. There might be little girls sometimes. Um, within the imperial palace, this is the Edo. Now in Tokyo, the imperial palace, they have a music building within the walls of the palace, and they give performances twice a year. Ordinarily, well. Now, on two days a week, people can enter the palace, can enter the palace grounds, certain parts of it. But otherwise, uh, it's restricted. You can't, you can't get in. When I was there, you had to have a pass. I had a pass. I was admitted as a student, so that was a big deal. I mean, I got to go in almost whenever I wanted so I could see all the rehearsals. And I got to play with them. When they had their weekly rehearsals, they allowed me. That was the one outsider allowed to join in. And um, it's, it was a very impressive piece of luck to get inside. One time I was wandering around after a, a session in the palace and I walked a different path out. And a policeman came up to me and said, excuse me, sir, where is it you're going? What are you doing here? And I said, I'm a student in the palace. He said, oh, okay, just stay on this side of the path and don't go on that side. I said, okay, because the other side is where the emperor lived. I couldn't get that close. When I got the medal, from the medal from the emperor, I went up the main gate. Wow. I mean, all this time I'd been going there for years, and then I got to go in the main gate. It was a very powerful experience of being in this very royal, elegant, and secluded space. Anyhow, these are the court musicians, and this is an old photograph, and I present this to you as a bad photograph. But, you know, in 1960. 56, this is 57, no, it would be 58, I think, when I took this. Uh, it would f colored Kodachrome slide film was ASA 10, speed of 10, if you can imagine, ASA 10. It's a miracle I got anything, so everything's a little blurry. But I know each and every one of these guys. I, you know, some of them were my teachers, some were friends. Um, I think they're all dead now, every one of them, but I, I know every, that's, that's how much time has passed. But this is the ensemble, the standard way they would play. 
And then, let me give you an example of how the music sounds. It's very slow. The flute begins. And this is actually the beginning of the composition, the fixed part of the piece. It just begins with the flute alone. The percussion comes in slowly. And it's slower than you can imagine because when I finally got to play with, and we get to play with them, they're weekly rehearsals, and I'd pl play and hold and waiting for the second beat, and I thought it was, I thought, oh, it's even slower than I, and I was hearing it all the time. So that was now one rhythmic cycle of four measures, four measures, four beats to a measure. This one is a common meter. Now oh, by this time we've got the third phrase and the string instruments start to come in one by one. This is Samba M no Q is the name of the piece. It is the last of a series of four, three movements and this is the fastest one. If we won't bother with the others, the other two movements. Um, I absolutely love this. I know some people can't stand it, but it gets very nostalgic, the sound. When I first heard it, I was a jazz musician, and I first heard this, and the sound of the shtigi sounded like almost bluesy, wild, and, and lots of embellishments, slides. So I took to it. I got very deeply interested in it. So anyhow, very slow music. So what do you do to mark off the space? You still want to keep that long, long length because that is a symbol of the, of the, the power and the longevity of the imperial line. But you've got to have some fun with it. So uh, what do they do? Uh, they play tricks, but it takes, it's hard to imagine now people doing it even now. This is, a, this is my depiction of a simple four measure phrase, a typical four measure phrase. Uh, each of those upright lines represents four beats, four beats. And the third one has a black dot on it. That's where the big drum strikes. And that's the main phrase point, the main accent of the melody. The melody is going underneath it. So the melody begins, jingle bell, jingle bells. You have a rest, and then the next phrase, jingle bell, jingle bells, and then they rest there. So each phrase is like that. And it goes on and on quite regularly, except you get a, some pieces, like a long piece like this, well, it's, it, you see the first two are, this, are equal, the first two, they match, and then they go break, 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 break. This one is four, this laps, uh, complements the rhythmic pattern perfectly, but then they start to break up. This one begins in the middle, and then picks up right before the drum stroke. This one is breaking again here. So they create an irregular pattern. Now that means that the pre people who are listening, if you really want to get what's going on in this music, it's not just long and slow. You keep the rhythm pattern in mind, and then you, uh, you, you keep the rhythm pattern in mind, and then you see how the melody staggers and eventually resolves at the end. It always resolves. They're all different patterns. This one, let's see. Um, yeah, this one here, for example, it breaks in the middle. It's off beat, off, off kilter, and it goes off kilter and actually in the very end, it doesn't, it doesn't resolve. The phrase starts just two beats before the, the, the last taiko, and then it ends. So uh, this is a really wonderful piece, Yahan Raku, mid, Midnight Music. It was supposed to be, it's, it's supposed to be from Tang China, Tang Dynasty, but there's no notation surviving in China, so we don't know. We suppose it was, but how they played it makes a lot of difference. Could have sounded very, very different. But this one is, a, no phrase seems to synchronize with the drum pattern. This is, a, this, and this one is eight, eight measures with one taiko stroke, one drum stroke. So every phrase is just broken irregularly, and imagine the challenge was, somebody was mentally keeping time of this very, very slow rhythm, and then seeing how the melody went in and out. That was the charm, not just long and slow, not just that long, continuous melody that lasts forever, but there was a challenge, there was a puzzle in there. It's like a different sense of time. In India, uh, for example, the challenging, people say, all the tabla players say, you see them play very fast and they're ripping along, 
So it's wonderful, you have magic. You don't know what's really going on. They, they say the most difficult thing is playing slow music because they memorize the space between each beat one. If it's a 15 beat pattern, 16 beat pattern, e eight pattern, it doesn't matter. They mark that space and then they mentally divide it up into 16, 10, seven, any, com any number they can, and then do multiple, sub so that, uh, m multiple subdivisions of that rhythm. So mind games, there are things in, the, in the, the ancient court musics that we have very little appreciation of. So the challenge was to keep it challenging and interesting enough to keep people awake. Thank you. <laughs> That's only one small part. There's a lot more to it than that. Thank you. What? I thought we were going to talk. We're going to talk now. No. <laughs> now I think we're going to, let's wait for instructions. No. Oh, yeah, no. Okay, no. <laughs> he said no. Come up. I don't know anything about what he just talked about. <laughs> In fact, my place in this Marcus. was about 15 minutes in time, the equivalent, Marcus. with this guy, where I played the shoko for Atam Laku. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's another ethnomusicologist in the house. I should have cleaned up my act. <laughs> Professor Marcus, thank you. Thank you. Nice to see but you. But I was interested in yeah. Japan. That's how I got here. Um, I got into architecture in f late f 49, 50, and uh, my professors had all been g returning GIs. They'd been to Japan, they saw the shrines, they saw the, the temples, and they were uh, really uh, into it. Uh, Gordon Drake, I don't know if anybody knows that name, but was there. He died in a ski accident. I ne never got to work with him. But the teachers, and, and uh, California, West Coast was very Asia-centric already with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright doing stuff. But uh, the, the Green Brothers, the San Francisco architects, uh, and we were building, in the 50s, we were building tract houses by the millions with two by fours. And our professors at SC started morphing into a Japanese uh, language because they saw those buildings, they were inspired by them. And so we were doing modular post and beam. Uh, and slowly, the, the spacing between the beams got to be on the module of tatami mats, and it was easy to start using tatami mats as a measure. Mm. My first buildings are, uh, my first first house I did for uh, Tatar for Julius Shulman's brother-in-law, which never got built, looks like a Japanese. Uh, so I was spitten, smitten, <laughs> and and uh, I was connected to a young, another architect in, in school, Greg Walsh, who had spent his uh, Navy time in, in Japan. He was a musician. He played classical piano. And he came back with everything Japanese. So I was immersed from the beginning and, and uh, excited about it and, and doing stuff that, uh, and I got into the, uh, I, w I was interested in classical music already uh, as a young kid in Canada with Glenn Gould and uh, Goldberg Variations. My family name was Goldberg at the time, so uh, Goldberg Variations, I thought it was my family. <laughs> <laughs> And so I started listening to Glenn Gould, which I still do. Um, anyway, there's a lot of those kind of weird connections, but my sister was playing in the UCLA Orchestra. Hmm. I was at SC, and she met this guy and uh, said, 
you probably would be interested. So she dragged me up to UCLA. That was 1956 or 57. I remember. He, he looked different then. Yeah. <laughs> I, Frank did too, I think. I <laughs> and uh, so I, I, he said, why don't you join the orchestra with me? And I said, sure, why not? I mean, I, I don't know how to play anything. Yeah, <laughs> but no, he did. So he yeah. got me one of those things, yeah, the, Shoko. The Shoko. Uh, and they brought a sensei from Japan to teach me how to breathe properly when I, oh, I can't do it again, yeah. but, and they played, uh, I remember the piece at the Nraku, which you just showed, wasn't that? This was a different one. This was different. Different. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, and I loved it, and I hung out with him, and did this for about six months, and that's it. That's all I remember, that's it. Yeah. That's it. I, I That's it. graduated. I got my PhD and went on to teach at the and, University uh, of Washington. And Frank went on to build. I went on to build, build. stuff. <laughs> uh, what happened? I designed a concert hall, Walt Disney Concert Hall. And uh, the Japanese, con my acoustician is Yasu Toyota, Japanese. And I still work with him. I, I'm in constant contact. He and I are working on some crazy stuff now. Uh, and he, the Japanese consul had a dinner for us and said, Mr. Gary, what, we would love to do something. And I said, uh, what could you do? And I said, I want you to bring the Gagaku to Disney Hall. <laughs> and there was a lot of breathing. <laughs> 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 and, uh, so anyway, I called Garfius. Yeah, right. I, I get called. Hey, I don't remember, remember, me. Me. I don't remember, remember me. me. I'm the clerk playing yeah. at the Nraku. Uh, he said yes, and he worked on it, and he brought them. Short story. Short story. Well, yeah, it took a lot of energy. Well, a lot know, of us we did just, a lot of work. The consulate into, finally helped. I don't want to go into the whole. Well, that's that's. It, but it's interesting that we were able to bring a Gagaku group to perform in Disney Hall, and they loved it. They said, this is the best hall we've ever played in. And they, they, the sound is just beautiful. I, Toyota gets a lot of credit for that. For the, he did the acoustics, but, uh, but it's a beautiful hall. They, they really, they, yeah, but they, I did something too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you knew what was going to go in there. You planned it. You planned it. I love Toyota. Yeah, yeah. We work together yeah. He's all the time. We're very soft-spoken, and uh, <laughs> we've got floating balconies and stuff going now. Yeah. You wouldn't even believe. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, he brought them there, and the audience was excited, and uh, they looked. It looked like a Japanese temple. It looked like yeah. the room, and so what I've been saying is the influence. Whether I like it or not, it's there. If you go there, you'll see it. And uh, I'm not asking you to go. Well, uh, Disney, <laughs> Disney Hall looked completely different when it was the bare stage, and then just this red felt mat that covered the whole center stage, and all the musicians are sitting directly on this red mat. It's a totally different. It almost looked right, Buddhistic yeah. or like it's a Shinto here. shrine. And I have a picture of it, it yeah. I swear. And a lot of, lot of that influence in my, my world it came from Asia, Asia-centric, Korea, yeah, as well. So, um, and I, it still does. I still look at that. But as a musician, it was 15 minutes. So forget it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember you told me this story about, about meeting Boulez, Pierre Boulez, the composer. And you guys were at a conference talking about acoustical, no, about music. And architecture, which is beautiful, I love that. And but no, but Boulez only wanted to talk about acoustical engineering and s the sound of concert halls, and they stumbled along like that until somehow or other they hit on the fact that they both loved Gagaku, and then the conversation took off. They yeah. came alive. That's a great story. Yeah. That's the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was sorry. I was going to let you tell it. You want to tell it? It'll sound better if you tell it. I think the I'll yeah. tell it again. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I did work with Pierre a lot till he till he passed on, and we designed a little hall in Berlin 
that's named after him, which he didn't get to see. It's a 600-seat Barenboim place there with the Devon Orchestra, the Palestinian Israeli. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, no, but but I think that Boulez was very taken by Asia, and and especially Japan. Well, the odd thing is a lot of Western composers are not interested in any other kind of Japanese music, but only garaku. And the Japanese are kind of put off, sort of embarrassed by it, which is odd. The Council General, the reason I got into that thing with Disney Hall was the Council General was afraid. He wanted to have garaku, so, okay, we're going to do what Frank says. But the Council General was terrified that this American audience would come and hate it (laughs) <laughs> because they the Japanese that, are they embarrassed by it. They think they don't understand this music. Yeah. It's not Japanese to them. It's so different. Because all Japanese, most Japanese music other than Garaku is vocal with some instrumental accompaniment and it follows the pattern of the vocal line, the poetic line. And this is formal music set out with metrical patterns and tricks. Uh, and so that's why he insisted that I be, I, uh, be and make a presentation at Disney Hall. And I said, Nobody has the right to stand on this stage with these court musicians. This is a thousand-year-old tradition. Who am I to get up here and make it turn it into Gagaku 101? That he insisted. Who so did? That I put the Consul General. Oh, right. He insisted. That's how. That's how come I got invited. But then once I was up there, I pulled Frank up on stage because we had to talk, tell the story that that's, this is what he had in mind when he built the place. So and he told the story. I, well, did I? You did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's his territory, so yeah. I can't talk about it. No, it's your territory. I moved into architecture it. Architecture <laughs> territory. <laughs> yeah. Right. Maybe we can talk a little bit about Bugaku, which is the dance yes. that accompanies Gagaku. That's right? the ex- exciting thing for me because the costumes. I, I was a friend with Issei Miyake, and his influence, uh, he was influenced by the Bugaku. A a lot. Lot. Which I didn't know until you said that. That's yeah. inter- very uh, interesting. That was a big thing for him. So, Too bad. That's interesting. I would have liked to talk to him about it. Yeah. Well, you can see it. In, yeah, uh, we see it in some of those architectural. Yeah. So uh, he just died, incidentally, yeah. but last year, two years ago, I think. Yeah, but I, th- I think yeah. I think people who are into fashion would. would yeah, would, yeah, it was just recently. Couple weeks, yeah. August. August. Yeah, August. Wow. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about but that can translation? I say one thing yeah, first? sure, absolutely. Because you said bugaku, and gagaku is the general term that applies to all the music and dance. Within that, there's kangen, which is string and, and winds. That's the instrumental performance. And bugaku, when there's dance. But it, it's not gagaku and bugaku. It's like it would be kangen and bugaku. It's a, sorry, it, I'm sorry. Nitpicking, I say. It's all right. I hope you like it. That's the more important thing. It's fascinating. And it's actually very architectural because yes. it's very symmetrical. Yeah, and very symmetrical. Right. There are a lot of layers that the um, yeah. dancers wear as a way of hiding their own individuality. Yeah. Um, they wear the masks and the headdress. Uh, there is kind of these um, restrained opulence um, right. attached to the, to, to the... Well, in this period, the, the Bugaku costumes that are used today are from the Heian period. That's from the Heian period style. In the Nana period, it looks like the robes were loose, loose silk, and probably the movements were looser too from the depictions we have. But this is achieved by having the silk is half-boiled threads going in the one direction they're un- half-boiled, in the other uh, direction they're completely boiled. So it's stiff, almost starched. And diaphanous, very you can see through it. The, uh, you can see the underlayer. It also tears very easily. But they like that architectural look to the. Even the emperors would be depicted in these robes, like they're sticking out in all all directions. That was the half boiled silk used in the costume. So there I was on the stage. Yes. Yeah. Good. As good. a as a kid. Pr- yeah. Pretending I knew something. No, you were doing it. You were. That was it. How, well, it. Tell, tell them how great we didn't was. stop. We we didn't <laughs> stop to fix anything. No, you, were, you were doing it. Yeah, I think if any if you get a chance to 
for the Sea to Dance, Bagaku, and it's, yeah. it's amazing for, archi for architects, especially. Yeah. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about play. It's a word that af applies to both architects and musicians. Musicians, yeah. of course, play and rehearse uh, yeah. as a way of attaining a certain degree of precision, if not perfection. And architects also play by rehearsing their sketches and ideas in models, sometimes hundreds of models. Um, how do you see, uh, you know, the interaction between play and <coughs> its free nature? dealing with the very prescriptive nature of both architecture and music, uh, two disciplines that are subject to codes, regulations, mm. commissions. Well, f for me, on, on the side, I, I get involved with the stage set for opera and, and experience what you're talking about. The, uh, because there the codes are gone, everything's gone. <laughs> you got music and the actors and the space to deal with. And uh, I worked with uh, Esperanza Spalding and, mm -hmm. and uh, Wayne Best. Shorter on an opera. Yeah. Which, beautiful. Which beautiful too, so you get these jazz guys, and, and it was like nobody had any plan of where they were going, and I didn't know where the hell. You know, so we worked together for several months. I had no idea of anything. It all just was intuitive response to them, to the music, to the time, the place. And uh, it came out beautiful. Somehow, very yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, very beautiful. So it's, a, a very, it's very an intuitive, spontaneous yeah. uh, something special about that. That's a historical event. I mean, that, that, that all came together in that way. Because Wayne now is that, after playing for years with Miles Davis, he gradually went off. And he did a number of years with the Weather Report, which was a kind of in the rock days of when everything was rock and roll. They tried to create a, a group that would be attractive to younger people. So they, they called it Weather Report. But still, it was basically an outgrowth of jazz. And then he went on to do his own things and his own records, his own solo recordings, more and more complex. And I think leading up to this thing, almost hymn-like, uh, and uh, Esperanza Spalding is just a phenomenon, uh, singing and playing the bass. But I think the point of why we're here together is the same, is that trusting that there's here's somebody that's a musician, Right? Yeah. And you let me into your club. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and You look okay. Yeah, I know, but uh, I didn't know where I was, you know, I am a fraud, but <laughs> um, the... At the time I was too. I had yeah, to but I think that's an, uh, uh, something that spontaneity of interaction without knowing where you're going yeah. is what I experienced with Wayne in, in his, and working on the opera. Uh, and well, it's very similar because I, you know, I can't read music. I can't. You know, I was thinking that when you said this, a lot of people think that Gangaku is frozen because it was mostly uh, most of the repertoire. There's 250 pieces now. Um, some of them long, some of them very short, but um, they mostly come from the Heian period and. Historically, we think they go back to China, many of them, many of them from Southeast Asia, as he said, Indonesia perhaps, uh, but certainly Southeast Asia and what, what is now Vietnam, Cambodia, and all those places. And the stories go back to that. It's hard to tell from that in the music, but in any case, it's pretty much a codified repertoire. The dance steps are all codified. So you're talking about creativity it doesn't but mean where quite does, the same thing. Where does where does it lead after that where, to the modern world? Yeah, Ta that's Taka, it. So Takamitsu. It was a, it, Takamitsu is one of the people who really Takamitsu and Mayuzumi each. When was that? In the sixties, they each composed mm -hmm. a modern composition for Garaku Ensemble, yeah. and that then it then other people began to do it. But most otherwise, it was mostly the same repertoire played again and again in the same way. But I want to say something about spontaneity. You know, in the end, for the listener, 
it doesn't matter whether it's a Beethoven sonata or what it is, it has to sound spontaneous and it has to sound like it's being created at that moment. So even Garaku, and they all, maybe you can go and say, oh, they all look the same, but I remember when I was a student there, you could tell from the recordings who was playing the shiriki, but the little phrasing, or you could tell who it was. Because, or, or for example, as the dancers were coming on the stage, from their posture, from their demeanor, they're all doing exactly the same step, but from their posture, you could tell, oh, this one's a really good dancer. This, and so this is the one when they're watching, when they're dancing in ensemble. This is the one to watch for, because this is really got it together. So there's this element of spontaneity being, cr being creative in actually reproducing the thing. Now, maybe yeah. you have to be creative when you play a Beethoven sonata, because everybody heard it well, before. What uh, did you would Wayne Shorter, when he was asked what he was going to rehearse, uh, <laughs> he said, you can't rehearse what you ain't invented. <laughs> I think that says yeah, it all for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's Great. I'm we, so glad you did that. I mean, I'm so, I didn't even know, we didn't talk about it, but I saw, I I saw I it one day and I said, wow. I, don't I didn't know you were involved in it. I got a few I other things I can Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Few, few, I haven't been keeping an eye on you close enough. Yeah. We don't see each other a lot, but this is an old, well, he, old he, friendship. He, he's, an old, he's, old friendship? He's three, three years too much about old. He's three years younger. So yeah. <laughs> just a kid. You know, I have to. I, did, I just turned 90, so I'm just Ooh. last month. So. <laughs> I'm, 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 but I'm still just a, a poser. <laughs> I have a question that yes. is related to the kind of conversation that has been going on here about continuity and evolution, because you talk about yeah. you know heritage and like being fro heritage can be something that is frozen in time, right? right? Exactly. And, and yeah. continues that way, or something that evolves over time. Yeah. So there's this continuity, right? So Gagaku embodies this duality well, right? Because you know you have these 250 compositions that have been yeah. there for centuries, yeah. and at the same time you have Gagaku is an inspiration for, for, con yeah. for contemporary composers, you know, John Cage, Alan Hovannes, yeah. uh, Henry Cowell. Were. But now the shrines and temples where Gagaku is performed are also kind of periodically rebuilt. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and, and ideally replicating the original shape, but you know, you have new generations, you have new technologies and new materials. So how do you see these two forces, you know, conservation and evolution, playing out in your own work? My work? As a scholar, but also <laughs> as, a, as a creator of... Well, conserva I mean, I respect a lot of what, what that is, and, and I enjoy going to visit those. But they're inspirational. Yeah. Right. That's right. the issue. So, the, so that is the, my question, right? You, you yeah, because so you're incredibly creative, but you're also... Yeah, I, I was once asked to do a, a, a dance uh, set for some of John Cage mm -hmm. student. I forget the girl's name. But anyway... Merce Cunningham? No, no, it wasn't Merce. It was a, a woman. Lucinda. Lucinda Child. Well, I did oh. a project with Lucinda, but before that... I can't remember her name, I'm sorry. Anyway, really good dancer. Came out of the cage and yeah. all those people. And she asked me to work on this program with her. And, and then she disappeared. And I waited for her to call. And she never called. And I didn't hear about it. And then a week before the program was to be played, she called me and said, huh? I hope you're ready. <laughs> yeah. So I blew it. I couldn't. I didn't know what to do. So mm. I realized that that's how Cage and 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 uh, Merce and and Jasper yeah. and Bob Rosenberg, who's a good buddy of mine, how they operated. It was spontaneity, and yeah. I, you know, asking me to do the dance. I wasn't in the club yet. I didn't, you know. Mm. So to pre presume that I could do that was silly on her part, but anyway, mm. it turned out. The Western society is very dynamic. That's, we pride ourselves on that, and we're very proud of the fact that we keep forgetting the old and developing the new, and we keep coming up with new things and new things. But after you know, that, in I Asia, would... it happens very rarely and very slowly, and, and as a matter of fact, like the person who studies brushwork, the calligraphy, 
you imitate the brush strokes of your master as carefully as you can, the pressure, and you do. It's very difficult because you have to be spontaneous. If you hang around too long, the ink will go through the paper. So you have to keep moving and get the strokes right. And you try very hard to imitate your teacher. And yet, no matter how hard you try, the student's work looks different than the teacher's. So we struggle to look for originality. We constantly look for what's new. But in the process, we're finding new form. But it, it's much harder to have new and significant content that is not based on the old. It creates something really new. And it does happen. So how but does that get, apply to architecture? Well, our cities are built, you see them, they all look alike. Yeah, kind well, of. <laughs> <laughs> no. So there's, there's room for innovation. Yeah. I truly believe so. But, and, and there are people that are, are measuring up to it. Uh, and uh, a lot, lot younger people now maybe are But nobody it. does what Frank does, though. No, exactly. No. So in your case, I mean, what is your relation with the tradition, you know, with the... With the I respect it. I mean, I, uh, Bobby Stern's a close friend of mine. I love what he does. I have a great respect. Uh, I just, but he's I very just, traditional. I'll tell you, I've been to a lot of his buildings, and I don't like the repetition of the past, but hmm. they always work. They're comfortable, you know, as a space, as a usable space. So I, uh, why complain, you know? I, I just uh, think that there's a lack of that, of interest in the, the culture of building commercial architecture. It's no. very difficult to break through that, because people, when they think of hiring somebody like me, they think, oh, you're going to be over budget. I don't want to get oh, over budget. Yeah. Right. Oh. You know, which isn't true. I've, I've been on, on budget in everything I've done. Oh. Somebody wrote a paper about that recently. <laughs> it is <laughs> <laughs> about being about my. <laughs> That's thing. quite a feat. Quite a feat. Yeah. So, uh, but I think uh, I think there is this fear, this uh, uh, editing kind of yeah. in the culture. So you, the chances of getting really great architecture spread spread around our cities oh. is more more and more difficult. You even have it here at the university. I went through. There's some nice buildings and some bad buildings. <laughs> right. Yeah. Should I tell you which one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I mean, it's just normal. We're just normal. We're living here. We're all on the planet together. We're trying our best, right? Everybody's trying their best. I'm trying my best. And music and architecture bring people together and yeah. hopefully closer together. So we want to touch a little bit on the audience and the role of the audience, not only in your um, concert halls, uh, Mr. Gary, that you've tried to always integrate musicians and audience, but also in Gagaku. What is the role of the audience in Gagaku and in conceiving the spaces where it is performed? Traditionally, there is the audience is the emperor or the imperial household, the palace. It's only the, it's not like an amateur group. It's not like having a symphony orchestra. Well, that also used to be played only for the nobles, and they were expected. There was a job. The nobles had to know the music. They had to be able to listen appreciatively. And in India, in the royal courts, these musicians would improvise, but the person who was sitting right in front of them had to understand the music and listen to it. If he did, it wasn't up to it. I mean, he he had to earn the respect of the musicians that he hired. So having good musicians also meant, like the Esterhazy, he was an amateur musician. He wasn't up to Haydn, but he played with them and and he ordered he requested that Haydn compose all his music. So there, now there's an audience for Gagaku, but. It's growing. I can't tell you. I mean, it, I don't know exactly what's going on in Japan today because I haven't really lived there for a long time. But um, there is an audience now for Gagaku, whereas in, when I was there in the 50s and 60s, there was none outside the mm -hmm. palace. It was performed ritually. And, and, the, and for that reason, the Japanese thought it's only ritual music. It has no musical value. But in the Heian period, it did. Everybody played. They played the interchange. They would change it. They would play whatever instruments were around, and they'd play set pieces, and different people would sing. And that kind of spontaneity is gone. But we do have this beautiful preserved body of compositions 
It's still there. The form is still there. The style of playing may have changed, but the form of the compositions are still there. You can still see, appreciate them and hear them, but there's no, there's no, maybe there's now beginning to be an audience for it. But. So am I correct to think that, you know, in the case of this Nihal, the, your idea was that to bring in the musicians and the audience together like in... Absolutely. That's like, what I mean. like during the Heian period, you know, yeah, like 10,000 like 10, like 10, years ago. Yeah. Well, I always believed in Shakespeare's thing, that all the world's a stage, blah, blah, oh. blah, you know that thing. Yeah. Uh, I think that the most important thing in, in building a music hall is connecting the audience to the players. And the uh, players feel it. I, I know that they talk about it. I'm sure you all know this. They feel the audience. Mm. It's when you give a talk in a, an auditorium, not like this one, I feel you're here, I understand. We're connected in some way. But sometimes you aren't. And, and many of you have given talks in, in places where the, you're not, you don't feel connected. You feel like it's really important in theater and, and concert halls and, and yeah. in life to connect people, to the, keep that in mind. And I think you can design a building that does that. If you make it a priority from the beginning, uh, which is, and, and out of that comes invention, actually. So uh, over time, you know, the, uh, Mahler changed the game. Uh, How? <laughs> he just changed it. <laughs> yeah, well, and he so did. The he Schoenberg, did. Schoenberg yeah. changed, Schoenberg did too, changed yeah. his right. game mm -hmm. and in our time. Schoenberg. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of others who've done that and keep doing that, and that's great. Yeah. And they're coming out of the woodwork, and we don't know who they are, and that's wonderful. They, they appear all of a sudden. They're your kids. One of your kids turns out to be that. <laughs> Isn't that great when that happens? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we are close to um, the end, so we want to ask if anybody has any questions in the audience. Don't be afraid. If not, we will <laughs> keep on going. There is a question there. I yes, I do. What's, who's your favorite kid? Who's your favorite kid? Oh. <laughs> that, that's how it is. That's yeah, you can't do that, out. man. If you get that, you get yeah. Somebody's going to find out you said No, yeah, we need the microphone now. Okay. Yeah, stand up and speak up. Well, it depends which rules and regulations. Whether it be with architecture, with music, with pursuing the object. Um, so there's the government, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, architecture is, is caught up in that because of building departments, safety issues. Uh, the idea of it is, is very positive, and, and uh, we rely on it to be positive. Sometimes it goes wanky, <laughs> but uh, like right now, it's, I seem to. But architecturally, I think uh, we've learned how to build better, and uh, we've got programs, uh, uh, computer programs, and things that are take us to the moon. And so <laughs> they're really, I rely on that. We've we've developed our own. Projects for that that way, uh, and so it's a new paradigm. It's constantly a new paradigm. It's constantly changing. 
the principles are the same. If you look at a Greek statue, my favorite one is the charioteer it, from Delphi. When I looked at it a long time ago, and I saw artist unknown, I cried because this mm. piece of sculpture was so is so beautiful, and you have the feelings that that artist put into that hundreds of years ago, and it still exists. When I saw that, I said, "That that's my Mount Everest. I want to be like that." That's now, uh, you know, you don't get there all at once, but uh, I think you use, what I'm, to answer your question, what you do is use the culture you're in. You can't, you're not going to be able to escape it. So you got the building department, and you got the Coastal Commission, and they got all kinds of crazy ideas that have nothing to do with making it more beautiful. And But you can work with it, and you learn to work with it. I think we all do. You don't get building, and uh, our cities all look what they do, but that's not, I don't think we want to do that, but that's where, where, where we're at sometimes. So we do, do the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> and don't expect to change the world. Just, Just very br briefly, Mary? Well, a concert hall is the place to make. Yes. Right. Yeah, you have to pay attention. The, that's why I work with this, with Yasu Toyota. He's the greatest. I don't understand what he's talking about half the time. <laughs> <laughs> He's very Japanese, but I, you know, we <laughs> we work together and have worked together for a long time, and and uh, uh, it just works, you know. We're, the the technology is there, the principles are there. You can make it happen. He's proven that. There are others who have done it, but he's done it really well, and. Uh, I, I, you know, I've got two or three buildings that work acoustically. That's pretty good for... Marvelously well. <laughs> Marvelously <laughs> well, right. That's pretty good for an old yeah. guy. Yeah, pretty good. That's pretty good. good. You're for, doing all right. For your elder. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm his teacher, so... so. <laughs> Still pull rank. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just um, meeting him and being <laughs> part of his uh, world has been a great, one of the greatest treasures for me. Even though I don't see him a lot, I, I, we're connected. I, I'm connected, <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we got here today. Yeah. And and I when he talked when they asked me to talk about Gagaku, I said I was only there for 15 minutes. <laughs> 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 okay. But coming from you, it means a lot. Okay. <laughs> well, on that happy note, <laughs> we um, are tremendously thank you, thankful um, for your presence here, your time, your precious insights. And if we can conclude with something, is that by putting together two disciplines, such as architecture and music, we can see things that we wouldn't otherwise. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And please. Keep on coming to the museum. There we have new events coming up, uh, new plans with religious studies. Um, so we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.